So by the time you're watching this, uh, maybe it's just still early May, maybe it's the day the assignment's due. If, if, uh, if the assignment's due in less than about two hours, maybe set the playback speed at, at 2.5 or something, because there's quite a bit of stuff to get through here. The goal of uh, this set of slides is to dive really quickly into designing an actual scheme. So instead of talking about these toy schemes using individual techniques, look at an actual scheme that's been used in some kind of compression format that's existed in the past. And so there's two parts to this. So this video will be discussing the algorithm used and some of the, the reasons why it was designed that way, although we still can't get into too much of a comparison of why this algorithm uses this particular sequence of techniques or what the advantages and disadvantages compared to its contemporaries are because we haven't seen its contemporaries yet. What's nice about this algorithm is that it is pretty self-contained. Um, if we avoid asking too many questions as to why the designer had a specific idea, it's actually pretty self-contained in terms of being able to implement it and it requires pretty basic data structures. And so one of the issues I'm going to have here is that I'm going to keep going back and forth between saying LZW and LZW. And it's one of these annoying pronunciation things. The scheme used here um, was, part, was originally used in an ancient compression format that uh, was generated by a program just called Compress on old Unix machines. And you can still use it. it, it you can still actually use it on our uh, common login server. So LZW is used for that. It was also used as the backing compression uh, method for this image format, which I also can't pronounce at the moment to avoid controversy. So um, beyond that, though, it, it fell out of favor for a couple of different reasons, um, one of which was that we developed better schemes that superseded it, but also there was some entanglements with software patents in the late 80s and early 90s that led to there being um, some question about whether it was a good idea to, to issue, especially commercial software that used uh, this algorithm. So where we left off, if you're actually watching the video in sequence, we were talking about this trick of using a bit reduction. We could, we could observe something like in this uh, example here, there might only be 15 or, or so characters actually used, distinct characters, and so we don't need to spend eight bits per character representing them. Instead, uh, we could go down to four bits or something. And we saw that that's a clever idea, and it's one of many clever ideas that when you try and actually execute it, when you try and generate a scheme that uses it, you realize that there's a lot of overhead that comes with using that idea. And so we saw already that using a bit reduction may be a clever idea, but it has a lot of cost if we're not careful in the overhead of describing that idea to the decompressor. Um, it's worth considering that if we discover that we can't go down to a smaller number of bits, so we know that if there's only 15 symbols, I guess we can go down to four bits if we're clever and we know how to describe that reduction. But if there are 129 distinct symbols out of 256, we still need eight bits. And so there are times when a bit reduction can't be used, no matter how clever it is, because we just have too many symbols available. And so we know that if we have eight bits, there are 256 possibilities. And we also know that if for some reason we were to use nine bits, there would be 512. Now, of course, the characters that we're getting, the input data is eight bits. So there's no reason to use nine bits um, out of nothing. There's, there's no reason that we should assume our input is already 9 bits. And so what this slide is bringing up is the, is the thought of maybe we could expand the width of our input bytes. We could take our input in 8 bits and then for some reason decide to begin treating it as 9-bit values. And the reason why that could be helpful is that uh, if we take our values in 8 bits and then we begin storing them in 9 bits, there are definitely at least 256 possible values that we haven't used yet. So if we have 512 possibilities, everything greater than or equal to 256 is definitely unused. And so we could actually use those extra values, the number 256, the number 257, to represent some other thing that might help us. So instead of trying to do a bit reduction, which we know may work in some cases, but might be completely useless in other cases, um, and actually may be actively harmful in other cases, so keep in mind that if I have 8-bit input values and I can't do an actual bit reduction, um, then I uh, could end up actually spending so much time on overhead, so describing the bit reduction that I'm not doing in the decompressor. If you take a look at the example at the end of lecture 2 and see how that would apply to 8-bit values, then I could actually end up spending so much on the overhead that I, I dramatically inflate the size of the input, even though I couldn't really do any compression at all. So one idea is, why don't we just try going the other way? Let's 
deliberately create more um, options for symbol choices. Let's use nine bits or 10 bits instead of eight, and then try and leverage those extra characters that we have available, those extra symbols that we can create. And the way that we're gonna do that in this example is we're gonna try and leverage patterns that exist in the text. If we're allowed to define new symbols, we could define ones that are convenient to us. So one example is we could observe whether we're looking at all English text or whether we're looking just at this, we could observe that the word the tends to appear quite a bit. So we could decide that uh, we have our characters 0 through 255, the usual ASCII values. But we have 512 possible symbols. So we could decide that, that symbol number 256 is the word the. So we have it, space, was, space, and then the symbol 256. So we don't have to store that um, in, in three symbols. So notice that if we're storing things in nine bits, the letters T-H-E are actually 27 bits um, because we, each one will be stored in nine bits. So we're, we're saving quite a bit here. We're, we're actually saving 18 bits if we store this uh, as just the number 256. Now you might notice there's a trap we could fall into here, which is that this looks like a really clever idea. We can replace common words, so we can actually see already a few other common things. There's the word was there. Um, there's the word of that appears twice, but actually we can do better. If we pull out this entire sequence here, or in fact this entire sequence here as its own symbol, we can save a lot. And as usual, the problem that we fall into is that we notice this great clever idea and we begin galloping forward with it without realizing that no matter how clever we think it is, there still could be a high cost to describing our trick in a way that the decompressor can understand it. So who's to say, given a particular input, that we choose these symbols? How would the decompressor know that? So in any case, we could define a bunch of symbols for common uh, bits of input, in this case maybe words, but if our input was binary data, anything else we might notice. And uh, then we could define some uh, mapping of these new symbol indices, so 256, 257, 258, uh, to the actual text that we're, that we're using as a substitution. Um, if we do this, um, just with these three substitutions, and notice that there are still some we could, continue, we, we, we could add, so the word of, for example. Um, the original input was, if we store it in eight bits apiece, 51 bytes. If we then expand it to nine bits per character, it goes to, to um, 58 bytes, so 459 bits. And then if we try and collapse it down using these substitutions, we actually do get some decent compression. So we get 1.2. Um, and, and we may remember that from that example with the bit reduction, we initially started at 1.2 as well. So we're already um, seeing some results. The issue is on this string, we know already the string has way too many patterns for comfort. So maybe results aren't typical. And there's also still the huge problem of how does a decompressor know that I use this set of substitutions? If it just gets IT space 257 space 256, how does it know what 257 actually means? I have to tell it that at some point. I assume in advance of it doing the decompression. So I have to convey that as part of my compressed data. So we, we are able to obtain some compression, so at least the idea is worth looking into. Um, and as usual, we have this. This is a, a sort of going to become a mantra in this course, just a slide that says this is a clever, but we have to be very careful about assuming it works. So as I said, there are a bunch of traps we can fall into. Just because we can condense down the actual compressed data um, to something small doesn't necessarily mean we've achieved compression because it might mean that all we've done is relocated all of that data to the overhead at the beginning of the stream. So we have to go through another one of these lists of questions. Um, we have to try and work out um, to what extent we can develop a scheme that actually satisfies all of these goals. So we do want to talk still about streaming input. And remember that we have the ability to cheat a little bit on that. So we don't necessarily have to work with one byte of input at a time. We could decide to save up 100 or 1,000. We just can't assume that we can read 10 terabytes of data before we make any decisions. Um, and that goes both ways. And you'll notice on the assignment that it's been that the streaming requirement has been specified carefully to indicate streaming in both input and output. So you can't save up your entire input into a buffer, and you can't save up all of your output into a buffer. You have to begin generating output before you're done reading all of the input if you have a large input. So uh, the first question, I guess, is even if we have some magical way of conveying these substitutions, how do we choose good substitutions? So how do we decide on a set of substitutions that are likely to give us good results? That's a tough one because we know that depending on the input, there could be um, the word the could appear many times or it could appear not at all because the input could be some arbitrary binary data. Um, can we make good choices with streaming input? Well, that's a tough one too because if we can't see the entire input, how do we know whether a pattern actually occurs often? Um, and then number three is a typical issue, which is 
no matter what set of common substitutions we define, we could come up with some input that doesn't contain any of them. And then number four is the bane of our existence, which is if we come up with some clever way of deriving substitutions based on our input, how do we tell the decompressor about them? Because if we can't do that, the decompressor won't work. So to answer number one, we have a couple of paths we can take. So the first path, the one that avoids the trap of question four, is we could define some set of substitutions that's universal. So we could just hard code in a list of substitutions that we're going to use on every possible input from now until the end of eternity. So it doesn't mean, we, that, uh, doesn't mean that we have to um, look at the input. We can actually make good choices with streaming input uh, with that option as well, because we don't actually have to derive our set of substitutions from the input data. We just have a set that we keep on hand. Now, this sounds maybe like a better idea than it is because it seems like, well, that's great. We'll have substitutions, and if we can use them, we'll use them. If we can't use them, then too bad. It's no, no big deal. We're not wasting too much. But keep in mind that the, the um, startup cost of all of this is taking every symbol of the input and converting it to nine bits instead of eight. So if we don't do substitutions, every single character we read will be written out in nine bits instead of eight. So if we don't do substitutions, that means that we've lost, we've already given up 12% because one extra bit to each character is about 12%. Um, so we, we have an interest in making sure we're doing at least one substitution in every input file. So the question is, how do we derive a set of substitutions that are likely to work universally? Maybe you can see that that's a completely impossible task to achieve. Uh, what does universal mean in terms of hard-coded things? If I'm designing a compressor and decompressor in 1987, and, like, like the original Unix Compress program, and I decide to hard code in some set of substitutions, what assumption can I make about which substitutions will still be relevant in 2020? Um, and which, is, which will be relevant to text files versus binary files? What happens if I make assumptions based on the machine code of architectures in the 80s? And that's all changed by now to, to a large extent. Um, and what if I'm making assumptions that don't foresee things like new file formats? Most of the file formats that we're used to working with whether they be compressed file formats or things like HTML or PDF or Excel spreadsheets or anything else, those didn't exist, at least in any substantial similarity to their current form, at the time the original Unix, Unix Compress tool was designed. So we could, though, try and do something like this. We could say maybe my compressor is only intended to work on text or something, and the format of text doesn't change too much over time. So we could do some analysis of a huge body of input data and then use whatever we get out of that as a way of developing some list of tried and true uh, global substitutions. So this is actually a useful technique. It's not necessarily something that's going to help us here, but it is a useful technique. And I want to take the opportunity to sort of put in a plug for um, the input data that I'm going to provide for the assignment. So we have this issue with compression of how do we know that a compression scheme works in general? Um, how do we know that it not only actually produces valid data, but that it seems to do reasonable compression, or at least not horrifyingly expand its input in a wide variety of cases, a representative set of cases. Um, and so this is a problem that, of course, has faced people designing compression schemes for decades. And one solution would be to, to uh, in a sort of uh, uh, unified, peer-reviewed sense, work out some common set of reference data that, that hopefully, based on rounds and rounds of peer review, is seen to be representative of the types of things one might want to compress in a general sense. And so two such things, we'll call such a collection a corpus of information. Um, two such things have been created, and we're going to use them. We're going to try and create our own over time. But I have some here. So I have this Calgary corpus which was the first attempt at creating some uh, agreed upon standard set of compressible files. We can take a look at the sizes of them. And you might notice the files don't have extensions like we're used to these days. Uh, and the idea was this is a combination of text and binary files in various formats. It includes things like images. It includes structured data. It includes binary data that I think in one case there's a core dump from a program that was running. Um, and if we run a compression tool on all of these things and observe that it seems to provide reasonable compression, that's a pretty good assurance that the compression tool isn't doing a, isn't that there's nothing hiding in the compression tool that will result in terrible performance um, in, in some obvious case. Obviously, no matter how many test files I use, there, there could be some weird worst case input that I haven't thought of. Another great thing about using these, this compression corpus is that it does give us a good benchmark for comparing different schemes. If I want to compare bzip to gzip, I could use the Calgary corpus as a point of reference. 
And what's nice about that is because it's something that compression experts have generally agreed upon, it's, uh, it's pretty old by now, but it is some reference point that's agreed upon, those numbers would have legitimacy. If I make my own scheme and I run it on the Calgary corpus, somebody else that knows about compression would say, okay, that, that does seem like there's evidence your scheme might have merit. Now, certainly more tests are needed, but it's much better to do that than to, for me to make up my own test cases and run my program on those. You can, you can see why that might, might be problematic. Um, a follow-up to the Calgary corpus was the Canterbury corpus, which I believe is named after a university in New Zealand. Uh, and I'll put links to both of the, the to the source data for both of these things uh, on Connex. And you can see here, this is a bit newer. You can even see that there's an Excel sheet in there, a I think a 90s era Excel sheet. Um, there's the man page for XARGs. There's an HTML file. There is this program called SUM. I suppose it's a program. It's executable. And there's a number of other text files. Um, and so the Canterbury Corpus also has a few things that are larger, and it, it was an attempt to remedy a few of the holes as, as they were seen in the 90s in the Calgary Corpus. So obviously in 2020, there are a lot of, if we were to construct a reference compression corpus now, we'd probably add a few more things. There are a lot of differences in file formats um, because of the way that we work with data that have occurred since the 90s, and so we, we would probably want to add some more things to this. However, this is thorough enough, especially for assignment one, to be able to make, to draw some conclusions about the way that um, our compression schemes work. So while I'm here, I could try running the ancient Unix compress tool. So it was called compress because it was before we really had very many alternatives. Um, there was one older tool that's still sort of in existence called PAC. And I was hoping to use that for an assignment, but it turns out that the modern implementation of it actually has bugs because nobody's used it in so many years. Uh, so we can't actually assume that we've got a, a working decompressor on some machines. So here's the Unix compress tool. It doesn't take any parameters um, in terms of compression quality or, or speed versus uh, compression performance, unlike gzip and bzip, because the algorithm is so deterministic. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pipe something in. I'm going to use that spreadsheet um, in the Canterbury corpus, and I will take the result, and I will pipe it to xls.uppercase z. So usually the, the customary extension we use for the ancient Unix compress tool is dot uppercase z. So I'll do that. You'll notice it's nice and fast. And if I take a look at this, we can maybe um, take a look at the size. You might notice that it's 300k instead of a megabyte. So we've actually achieved a compression ratio of over 3. Now maybe that's because the um, old uh, XLS format has a lot of um, easily compressible data in it. It might have lo long runs of binary zeros or something that are really easy to compress. I suppose as a point of comparison, let's run gzip at its uh, highest speed, lowest compression setting and see how competitive it is. Oh, whoops. So we can see here that if I run gzip at its lowest compression setting, so dash one, I still get better compression than the ancient compress tool. And I would imagine that if I use LZMA or if I use bzip, I'd probably do even better. Um, but in any case, I can run this compress tool. I just pipe something in, pipe something out. I can now decompress. So I do compress dash D. Um, one would normally use a program called uncompress for this, but these days I prefer compress dash D because uncompress on some operating systems is alias to something else. So in some cases it's alias to gzip. So please use compress dash D, especially on our login server. So there's kennedy.xls.z. And then I will... Um, Type it to decompress.xls. So just to compare those, if we take a look at it, we'll notice that the decompress.xls is exactly the same size as Kennedy.xls. So certainly we expect that. We expect it to be identical. But the way the gold standard for that, given that this is lossless compression, is we should diff them. And diff says nothing. And if we're paranoid, we might want to actually force diff to tell us something. We know that diff usually says nothing if the two files are identical. This dash s flag will actually tell us, just in case we're worried about it. It says they are identical, bit for bit, byte for byte. And of course, that is the standard we expect out of lossless compression. Um, so for your assignment, um, you will be writing a program that uh, takes the place of this command. So we won't use the compress program. We will use your program instead. The output that is produced by your program, if I put it into a file, should be decompressible with this command. So you're not writing this decompressor. I'm going to run the built-in compress-d command, and the output of your program must decompress using that command. That will be a very easy way of validating that the output is correct. And of course, once, the, once it's been decompressed, I'll expect that the result, this, in this case decompress.xls, 
diff identically to the original input because if not, we didn't achieve lossless compression. Arguably, we didn't achieve any compression because a basic requirement of compression is that the result be identical to the original input after I've decompressed. So let's go back over to this. So I could use the Calgary corpus or something to do some analysis of what I think is a good reference data set. I could go, of course, much bigger than that. If I want to analyze English text, I could look at the dump of the entire English Wikipedia or, or Wikipedia in every language to analyze patterns in text. Um, and then I could make up some list of global substitutions. Uh, and of course, the issue there is that how do I know that's going to remain current? How do I do 256 different symbols that somehow cover all of my bases? But it is true that I could certainly pick out some things. I could observe that in English, QU appears uh, consecutively a lot. And probably in binary files, I see things like this quite a bit, um, or strings of zeros. And certainly those are low-hanging fruit. Those are easy to compress. So I, I could use a global list, but I don't know if I'd, I could expect too um, exciting results out of that. So, of course, if I use the global list, question three becomes very significant because if I know the global list, I could easily construct an input with none of those substitutions. And I don't know if in 10 years someone will design a format, a regular file format, that for, by coincidence has none of those substitutions. So maybe I want, therefore, to create substitutions dynamically based on the input. And that's the issue with these four questions. It's hard to answer, to, to get a good answer to all four of them at once. Because if I need to use the input to make my decisions about substitutions, then question two becomes a problem. If I choose a global set of substitutions, question three becomes a problem. So I guess the alternative is I try and design a set of substitutions for each input. I could scan through the input or a part of the input to find patterns, and then I use those as substitutions. But then that creates a problem in question four, because if I'm designing my substitutions on each input, I have to have some way of conveying my choices to the decompressor. Um, and then, of course, question two creates a problem again, because the more of the input I need to see, the less I'm actually designing a streaming scheme. So these, it's sort of intractable to solve all four of these problems at once. And so what I want to talk about is this scheme LZW that tries to make a compromise between them. And it's a real compression scheme, so maybe it's reasonable that it makes this compromise. We have to make compromises like this in these real schemes. It's also worth considering not as much of a deal now, but it was also designed to be fast on 1980s era technology. And so it, it had to certainly um, compromise quite, quite severely in a few cases. So LZW does use different substitutions for each input. It doesn't make some global list. And what it does is as it walks through the input data, it builds up a set of substitutions to use using a deterministic process. Um, and in particular, it creates the new set of substitutions based only on characters that it's seen so far. So if it's looking at character i in the input, the only things it could have used to construct its substitution table are characters 0, 1, 2, 3, up to i minus 1. The reason why that's helpful is it means that if it uses a reliable deterministic process to create these things, and it only creates them based on input that's already been uh, read, the decompressor could duplicate exactly the same logic as it goes. It could just uh, reproduce the um, logic used to construct the table on the compressor's end as it decompresses each character. Therefore, we don't actually have to send the, compression, the, the uh, table of substitutions to the decompressor. All we have to do is allow the decompressor to walk through the same compression sequence one step behind the compressor. So they move in lockstep. And we'll notice in future schemes that we see, that is a very common trick to use. To avoid having to tell the decompressor too much, we just have both sides, compressor and decompressor, follow a common set of rules so that the decompressor can duplicate completely the thought process of the compressor. So the basic idea is very common to the family of schemes that LZW belongs to. So there was this primordial scheme called LZ77, which is very powerful, and uh, it led to something called LZ78, so 1978, which eventually led to LZW. And this is the ancestor of a huge family of schemes, and we'll study those in greater detail later, that uh, rely on one common insight, which is that input data tends to contain patterns that repeat. Maybe they don't repeat instantly, maybe they repeat a little bit later, but if I see a particular combination of bytes in my input, there's a reasonable chance I'm going to see that combination of bytes again at some point. 
Uh, and so in this example here, I can actually, uh, all of these highlighted overlapping bits do occur somewhere else in the string. And now this is exaggerated because this is a string that deliberately has way too many patterns. Um, but you can maybe appreciate that if we look at an entire English book that we can expect to see some patterns repeating quite regularly. So the word the, particular letters are more likely to be at the beginning of a sentence than others. And so the LZ family of schemes tries to exploit the fact that we may see a pattern occurring again somewhere later in our input stream if we see it once. And the question we have to answer isn't, are there patterns in data? It's how do we find a way of compactly in incorporating those patterns later in the data without having to explain too much to the decompressor? So it turns out that in the most extreme case, if we could just define our own set of extra symbols, we could do this. We could say S1 is this first subsequence and S2 is the second one. And then the compressed data becomes I and then S1, B and then S2. And you might notice that this is a big problem for the decompressor. If all the decompressor gets is this thing, then how does it know what S1 is? We have to provide S1 somehow. So if we make this table of special symbols, we then have to send it to the decompressor separately. There are a couple of compromises that we can make uh, on this. So we don't want to have to send a table of symbols to the decompressor in advance especially if we don't know whether we're going to use all of those symbols. Here we got lucky. We chose two symbols that were very useful that cut out tons of text. But maybe we choose lots of symbols and then we run through gigabytes and gigabytes of text and we never actually use them very much. And so we don't um, make up the lost bits that we had to spend describing our symbol table to the decompressor at the beginning. So maybe a, uh, another choice would be, this is a bit of a visually busy slide, we could, instead of just encoding everything with these symbols all the way through, so S1 never actually appears, the, the contents of S1, these characters here, never actually appear in the input, in the compressed text. We have to provide them separately. So one compromise is, let's allow the first occurrence of each symbol, so there's S1 in this example, let's allow the first occurrence to appear as plain text, and then encode somehow that that becomes a symbol so that the decompressor can use it the second time it occurs, like here. Um, that does solve the problem of how does the decompressor find out about the initial contents of a symbol, so the bootstrapping problem. What it doesn't solve is, how does the decompressor know that this thing is supposed to become a symbol? Um, we have to tell it somehow. We could incorporate some metadata into our stream that describes that to us, but that again creates overhead, and we still have this problem of not wanting to invest in overhead unless we can be sure that it's going to pay off later. So LZW does something, uh, makes a compromise to this. This scheme, um, the one illustrated on this slide, sort of implies that we use some clever logic to go find a good set of symbols, things that could definitely be reused. You might notice that every symbol in my list here does actually, get, uh, does actually appear more than once in the text. So maybe it's paying off to have them. One alternative to that might be to create a set of symbols, some of which might never be used but have it be so easy to know which symbols to create that we don't have to describe how to create them to the decompressor. It, it might know in advance when to create a new symbol. And maybe this means it creates a huge number of symbols, some of which go to waste, but it doesn't cost us any bandwidth for it to do that. It just costs the decompressor extra memory. So it's worth considering the exact issue of how do we tell the decompressor what thing is a symbol, what patterns to repeat, is a big problem in these LZ schemes, and there are many different ways that it's handled. Uh, and that's one reason that the family of schemes is so large, because there, there have been so many different approaches to this. And the, uh, the compression algorithm used by gzip, which is called deflate, is also based on one of the LZ family of schemes. It just is a different branch of the family tree. So this scheme, LZW, uses a very simple algorithm to build symbols as the input is read. And it keeps adding more and more symbols to its dictionary of symbols. And uh, because it uses a deterministic algorithm that can be uh, run only on the existing bits of encoded data, the decompressor doesn't need to receive the symbol table explicitly. It can just follow the compressor's lead and build the same table the compressor's building. And so no bandwidth is needed for that. The disadvantage is, and you'll see this pretty quickly, that um, the list of symbols it creates is full of all sorts of symbols it never gets to use again. So it creates a lot of wasted symbol entries. Um, so we have to set this up. So in this, I'm going to go through this example a little bit quicker in the recording of the lecture than um, you might 
prefer, basically because the example has dozens of steps, some of which aren't terribly important to the insight into the algorithm. Uh, I've designed the slides so that you can go through the example really slowly if you want to as you work through it. Um, in particular because uh, it's very likely questions will appear on exams about doing sort of encapsulated versions of a scheme like this. So not the full 8-bit ASCII version, but uh, a simple version where maybe you'll be given an alphabet of just A, B, C, D and told to use LZW compression on that. So what's going to happen is I'm going to maintain this table of symbol values over here. Each symbol has an index. And we saw earlier, for example, I could say that number 256 um, maps to a particular string. Number 257 maps to a different string. So we'll store them in this table. We probably want to store the table as some kind of dictionary structure to make it easy to look things up. Um, I also want to observe that for the sake of the example, the compressed data stream is going to be a list of numerical values. That's it. We're not going to worry about how we encode those values into bits until part two of this. Because really, the point of LZW is to perform a transformation. How we encode the transformed data to, trans uh, to transmit it or to store it into a file is not really LZW's business. So what the compressed data will contain is a bunch of numerical values from 0 to 255 if they're single characters, and then larger numbers, 256, 257, potentially going on uh, as long as we generate new symbol indices. So the first index we're going to create will end up being 256. Then we'll create 257. And we could go up and create thousands and thousands of new symbols. How many we want to create at most is an implementation decision. Um, so each symbol is a numerical index. Now, to be for the sake of the example being more accessible, um, what I'm going to do is uh, this letter here, the letter A, is actually the number 97. And this letter here is actually the number 98. So my input sequence is a bunch of 8-bit values. It's only because I happen to know that it's text that I'm representing it as actual ASCII characters. What I'm going to do because we're working with a text example is if we ever have a numerical value that appears in the input or output that is a character, like the number 98 is the letter B, I'm going to write it as the letter B because I think that makes it easier to read. But keep in mind, what's actually being written to the compressed data stream is just a bunch of numbers. And if I was compressing binary data, I, I wouldn't want to assume that they're letters or anything else. So the first step of LZW is to um, seed the symbol table with a, an entry for every single character. So the entry is lined up to the, in, the index of the entry is lined up to the character's numerical value. So uh, index 0 contains the, the single 8-bit value 0. Index 1 contains 1. Index 97 contains the letter A, which has numerical value 97. 98 contains B, which is 98. And then 255 contains 255. So this is done before the algorithm starts in all cases. And to be clear, the reason we go from 0 to 255 is that we're working on a source alphabet that's all 8-bit characters. Um, it's worth considering that it would be a great exam question to ask you to run LCW where the source alphabet was something else. So suppose I gave you, I'll use this earlier slide as a way of demonstrating this. Suppose I said that the uh, source alphabet only had four characters and they were just A, B, C, and D. So not all 8-bit values. Well, in that case, you would see the table like this. You would seed it with every element of the source alphabet and an index for each one, usually an index corresponding to its number in the source alphabet's ordering. So there's no reason we have to work with 8-bit values, although in practice we generally do. So for the sake of the, the table on the slide not getting too cluttered, because this list of symbols is always there, that is always the initialization of the table, I'm going to leave it off. And we'll just assume that they're always there. So the first thing I'm going to show here will be this, this, the indices here will start at 256, even though every, we will assume that in all cases there are 256 symbols above it, numbered 0 through 255. So here's what the algorithm does. It walks through the string one, uh, one character at a time. And at every step, it maintains what I'm going to call a working string. And at the beginning of the algorithm, so this is the very first step, at the beginning of the algorithm, the working string is empty. And so uh, at each step, though, at the end of the step, the working string may be empty. It may be something else. So at each step, I grab the next character. And then I try appending it to the working string. So at this point, the augmented string I create is just the letter B. And I ask the question. Is the thing I just created, this augmented string, is this somewhere in the symbol table right now? And the answer in this case is yes, and it is here. So this, the string uh, just containing the character B is in the symbol table. It is at index 98, so it is found. If I find that augmented string, 
then the working string just becomes the augmented string and I move on to the next character. I generate no output. Uh, and so in this case, I generate no output and I move on to the next character. The next character is A. So my working string was the letter B. And so my augmented working string, if I append the letter A, is BA. So I ask the question, is the string BA somewhere in my symbol table? And at this point, there's, there's nothing over here. And I have all these other things that were already in the table, but they're just single characters. So the string BA is not in my symbol table. And so in the event that my string is not found in the symbol table, I do this. First, I set my new working string to be uh, the new character by itself. So I don't include B, I just have, I reset the working string to be a single character A. Then I output the index for the old working string. And to be clear, what I'm actually outputting here, again, is the number 98, the index of this thing in the symbol table. I'm going to write it as the letter B because it makes it easier to read. But I'm, in, I'm, I'm outputting the index of that working string B in the symbol table. And then I take my new augmented working string, the one that wasn't found, and I stick it in the symbol table at the next available index. So notice that I do create an index for BA. So if I ever see it again, it will be in the table. But my, aug my augmented working string doesn't become the new working string. The new working string is just the letter A. So that's a key point. And we're actually going to come back to that in a month when we talk about the LZ family of schemes, that there's an interesting um, uh, improvement on the basic algorithm of LZ78 that was made by, by observing this. So just the slide is now clarifying my point about using letters and numbers. And so I, I throw BA into the symbol table, it gets index 256. Again, you have to keep in mind that indices 0 through 255 are already taken. The next character is N, and my old working string, as we can see at the end of the previous step, was A. So I take a look at my augmented string AN. And I notice that that's not in the table, so then I throw it into the table at index 257, and I output the index of the working string I had before, which is the number 97, or lowercase a. And then my working string is n, so I append a and I get na, also not found, so I throw it in the table, and then I output the index of n. I don't know off the top of my head what number that is, but it's a number. Um, and then at this next step, just to be clear, the new working string there is the letter A, so I append N to it, and I notice that uh, AN is found in the symbol table. And when I find the thing I'm looking for in the symbol table, I just keep that as my working string, and I move on. I do not output anything. And the idea is, that means I've seen this string before, and my goal is to try and build up the longest string I ha that I have that I've seen before, and then add one character to it, and output something based on that. I don't want to output anything prematurely because that will not give me the advantage of actually having a symbol table. So I look at the next character, it's A. I try appending um, the letter A there. And in that case, A and A is not found, so I toss it into the symbol table. And then the thing I output is the index of the working string before that point. So in this case, the index of A and is 257, and so I output 257. Um, and we should also observe that actually here, uh, I've already read that last character, but because there's still something in the working string at the end of this step, I have to make sure I follow through and when the encoding is done, dump out whatever's in the uh, working string. So in this case, working string is just the letter A. Um, and so we can actually view this as sort of an extra step of the algorithm of, of working with an, uh, a zero-length character or something. I almost said null character, but we should be very careful not to say that because that might actually be a real character. Um, and so then we can we just throw that into the end of the sorry this is throw that into the end of the, the string there. Uh, it turns out that um, when we're done, we actually need to have five symbols of compressed data. So that's BAN257 and A. Because we have to store everything in nine bits, because 257 won't fit in eight bits, we end up needing six bytes, as it turns out. So actually, we've achieved no real compression here. The example's too small to have achieved that because of the bit inflation of needing to use nine bits. The original input was six bytes long, and so is the output. Maybe you can take my word for it that we can achieve compression using this scheme because we are able to replace substrings with single indices. And I have a longer example here. Um, I'm going to, as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to flip through this one pretty fast because I, I mostly want to keep the entire animation of the example in here for you to look at. Um, but I want to stop at a couple of points to observe significant milestones in the compression procedure. 
So here's a longer string. It's one of our favorite home row strings, which means it has a very limited character set. And that means maybe that there's more likelihood of there being patterns in it. So we'll run through it. Um, and we go as before. The first character is found in the symbol table because the letter A is a single character. And therefore, uh, A numerically is the number 65. That is in the symbol table at index 65. And then we keep going. A plus a space isn't found because there's no two character symbols yet. And so we add it to the table and then output the old string. And then we proceed as before. Um, and we'll keep walking and take a look at what happens when we get down to, as we proceed through the algorithm, we notice some patterns forming. And then in this case, um, at the previous example, we were able to use symbol 256, which is A and a space. And then at this point, we notice that we have this three character sequence that we go looking for in the table and it's not found. And so the procedure in that case is to add the three character sequence to the table, which we do. And then we keep walking. And we notice as time goes by, the symbol table fills up pretty quickly. We create lots of new symbols. And over time, the symbols get larger. Because as we use up all of the possible two character patterns available to us in the sequence, we begin to see them again and again. And then we're able to proceed further and make our working string longer. And over time, we get working strings that are three characters or four characters also getting entered into the symbol table. And so we end up with this, which is a compressed stream with 19 symbols, which gives us a compression ratio that's a little bit over one. So we're achieving some compression here, even if we can, uh, are uh, taking into account the 9-bit inflation. It's still not that impressive, um, because you might notice that we do have to spend quite a bit of time spinning up, getting ready to begin outputting non-single character symbols as our symbol table um, is initialized. And this is the consequence of having a scheme where uh, we don't pre-initialize the symbol table to some common set of patterns. We have to create the patterns as we go. And you might also notice that there are plenty of symbols. I can see right here that this one, for example, is added to the table because the algorithm has to add symbols to a table in a specific form, but it never actually uses it. And so that's a consequence of this algorithm. It's great because it means the decompressor can just follow the same process. We don't have to convey to the decompressor when we're making a symbol and when we aren't. However, we end up with a lot of junk sitting in our symbol table. Um, as we get longer and longer inputs, maybe we can see more advantages. So here is the, uh, this is the first paragraph of Tale of Two Cities. And it's, so it's, we've seen this example before, 416 characters. If I try to encode it, I'm not going to include the full example, but um, if I try to encode it, I end up with this. And we can see the symbol table is certainly being very well used. We're getting symbols up in the 400s here. And we get a compression ratio of 1.5. And you might also notice that as time goes by in this algorithm, as we go from top to bottom here, the number of single characters tends to decrease because we, we tend to be able, because we have such a large table, to use lots of existing symbols and therefore save some space. Because we know that every number above 255, 256, 257, 258, everything that's large than 255 represents at least two characters. And therefore, if I'm using numbers bigger than 255, I am um, collapsing at least two character sequences into one symbol. So here's some pseudocode for this. Um, this, the implementation of the assignment, uh, modulo how we store things in bits, that's part two, uh, is basically to implement this pseudocode, to just walk through our input. So for each character in the input sequence, that looks to me like, you know, read the, the input one character at a time. Um, there is, of course, some implementation stuff, like what exactly is a symbol table? You have to make up your own mind about that. You want some kind of dictionary structure. You'll notice the assignment puts a couple of restrictions on the way that can work. Um, but ultimately, if you implement this pseudocode, uh, you pretty much have the LZW algorithm. Um, you may want to think about this. I'm not going to go through this now, but you may want to think about the running time of an algorithm like this. And the key thing there, the reason it might be a trick question is it is very heavily dependent on uh, what the symbol table actually is because we do ask questions that are, Ill, that are not very well specified here, like if the augmented string is already in the symbol table. So we're having to ask a question about whether a string is in some kind of set of strings. And so the, the time of that search impacts the running time of the full algorithm. Um, certainly, the running time is at least big O of n on an n character input. So that's, but you knew that. Um, so the question is uh, next. So we've created this thing. And we should learn to be skeptical here, because I created this magical sequence that apparently compresses data. And we should know that people say that all the time. And a lot of people create these amazing, fanciful compression schemes. And nobody ever stops them to make them think about whether the compression can be reversed. 
So they have this clever scheme that takes a uh, thousand bytes and turns it into ten bytes, and it does, it seems too good to be true because it is. So we should always, um, when we're talking about compression, we we shouldn't believe in anything until we are satisfied that we can actually do the decoding of whatever uh, transformation that we create. So I have this. This is the result of our first example. And the question is, if I provide you with only this, you have no other information, you don't know what was in my symbol table, is it possible to recreate the entire input string? Uh, and the answer is yes, as it turns out, but you deserve to have that proven to you. So what's going to happen is we need to be able to, for example, know what 257 means. We need in our decompressor to be able to reconstruct the symbol table used by the compression algorithm. And we have to do that one character at a time. As, as we're able to decipher each character, we need to make sure we always have the same uh, symbol table that the compressor did so that we can keep it up to date. So decompression is pretty easy to start with because um, we take the letter B and we know that the first character is B. We know that if we were compressing right now, the first character of the stream always just gets written out by itself because the symbol table uh, is going to be uh, empty to begin with besides the single character symbols. And the first time we see two characters together, that goes into the table and then it gets written back out. So I know that the very first thing that gets written to the compressed data stream will just be the first character of the input. And then I take a look at the next character and I'm, I'm sort of mimicking here in the decompressor, I'm mimicking the compression procedure. I don't actually need much of this to do the decompression of the current character. What I need this for is to follow along with the compression procedure so I can recreate it. So my working string after the first step is the letter B. So I'm basically taking each character that I decompress and then recompressing it in my head so that I can uh, update the symbol table. So the next character I get is the letter A and my working string was the letter B so I try looking at the augmented string, it's not found, and so I do exactly what the compressor would do here, and I stick that in my symbol table. And then the working string becomes the letter A. So I'm just recreating the compression logic in the decompressor. The next character is N, and so uh, my working string was A, so I look at AN, AN is not in the table, so I add it, and then I output the, the letter N, and, I, and it goes there, uh, and my working string becomes N. And then I hit this, 257. And you might notice that when I started, I didn't know what 257 meant. But by the time I got to this step, there is something called 257 in my symbol table because I've been following along the compressor's logic. And so that's no big deal. I know that 257 is the substring AN. Now, the trick here is I have to make sure that I now take all of those characters. I know the next two characters are that string AN. I have to take each of those characters and add them to my my decompressed data stream one at a time so that I can duplicate the compression logic for each one of them. So I add the character A and I follow along the usual LZW compression procedure for this and that does in fact um, in involve you know adding something to the symbol table and then I add the character N and I notice that in the compression procedure that does get found in the table so I do nothing. But it's significant that I am able to do that because I need to make sure at every at every moment the state of my symbol table is exactly the same as the state of the compressor's symbol table at that step. And then I see the letter A from earlier um, and I output that. And the symbol table gets updated but I don't really need it anymore because um, I, I've already decoded the entire string. So the reason why uh, this, this can be um, annoying is that th this is clever because uh, the decompressor is able to recreate the symbol table using only the decompre decompressed data stream. That's it. There's no need to convey separately the symbol table. Now, of course, that means the reason it could be annoying is that we have to create the table in a very predictable way. The compressor, even if it has some clever insight into the data, can't use it unless the decompressor also has that insight. And that means, for example, that we end up having to add tons and tons of symbols that we may never need again. Um, even if the compressor knows that a particular symbol will never be needed again, it has to add it to the table so that the decompressor can duplicate its logic. So there's one special case I want to get to, um, which is the decompressor generally works by staying just one step behind the compressor and then catching up to the compressor after each step. 
there is one situation where that can create a little bit of a mess, and it's unique to LZW. It turns out that it is a the LZW variant of a trick that is used in many LZ schemes, uh, which allows the compression algorithm to actually get the data, to get its compressed data stream a little bit ahead of its input if it needs to, to find patterns in the input that actually overlap the current character. So we'll see that again in a formal context later. So. Um, in the previous example, we had no trouble decompressing because we might have seen some symbols, so in this case the symbol 257, that we didn't know about when the process started. But by the time we got to the 257 in the, in, in the compressed input stream, we did actually have an entry in the table called um, 257. In this example, something strange is going to happen. So for the sake of having an example to play with, uh, I'll put the entire animation in the slides, but I'm going to skip through it until we get to that point. Um, so we'll start decompressing this. This is a valid input, and you should look forward to maybe seeing on an exam similarly ominously phrased things like, yes, it's a valid input. Take this valid input and decompress it. So the input's definitely valid. We have to be able to decompress it. Um, so I start with A, and I keep running through it in the same way as before. And I'm maintaining my symbol table as I go. And I hit 256. And we know that by this step, I actually have symbol 256, which is great. So I take all the things in symbol 256, that's A and N, and I add them to my decompressed data stream, and I catch up with my, um, with my symbol table for the compressor, and I end up with this situation. So the symbol AN uh, obviously already exists because I used it just a minute ago. I used the number 256. So I get to this point, and notice that the symbol table is now queued up at 264. I haven't created symbol 265 yet. And I've just finished, so at this point here, I'm now done decoding everything up to this step. I have a working string sitting in the buffer, but I don't actually have anything else to do before I hit the next character in the compressed data stream. But the next character in the compressed data stream is this, and I don't have anything to use here. So what's happened is the compressor has gotten a little bit too far ahead of me. Um, the decompressor is being told to use symbol 265, but there is no symbol 265. And if you tried encoding this string, you might notice that symbol 265 actually gets created somewhere around this point in the compression process, but just a little bit too far ahead for the decompressor to already have it. So the question is, what do we do? And what we have to do is reverse engineer the compression procedure. So, okay, the, the slide's pointing this out, that this is a valid input, just in case you didn't, you didn't hear that earlier. So I have to be able to do something here. The compression algorithm did produce this exact uh, compressed data stream. So what we have here is what's called the CSCSC problem. And in this case, each C is a single character, and there is some subsequence S occurring twice. And it's unique to this one case. It's the only special case the algorithm has. Um, and when this occurs, we end up having to use an index that doesn't exist yet. We have to work backwards and try and figure out what that index is supposed to look like, even though we don't have it in our table. So 265 is almost here. If I was maybe one step in the future, I would have index 265, but I'm not. And I have to try and reverse engineer what index 265 looks like. Now, keep in mind, index 265 could end up being five characters or something. It could have a five character symbol. Um, I only need one of them, or maybe two of them. I only need enough characters to work one step ahead. If I can figure out maybe the next character of the decompressed data, maybe that's enough to catch up to the compressor. So I don't have to know everything in symbol 265, just the first character or the first couple of characters. So what I want to do is reverse engineer. I know that 265 is the next character, is the next symbol I'm going to add to my symbol table. I also know that I'm duplicating the compression logic here. And I know that every time I add a symbol to the symbol table, it is the contents of a working string plus some other stuff. So in this case, my working string is AN. I don't know when I'm going to add symbol 265 to the table, but I do know that symbol 265 is going to be added based on the text AN and then some stuff. We know that at each step, we append a character to our working string, and if the result is in the table, we keep going. If the result isn't in the table, we add it to the table. But in any case, we never clear the working string unless we've added it to the table. So I know that whatever I add to the table next is going to be an followed by some stuff. And so then I can predict 
if I want to get just one character ahead, I can predict that symbol 265 will be a n and then some stuff, which means I do actually know the next character of my decompressed output. So I don't know how symbol 265 ends, but I do know how it begins, which means the next character must be the letter A because symbol 265 starts with the letter A. And so I take, I assume the letter A is the next character, there it is, and then I duplicate my compression logic for the character A, and I end up with this. My augmented working string is ANA, which isn't in the symbol table, and so I add it. And now I have character 265, and so I can then proceed through character 265 uh, and decode it. Um, and so this is the CSCSC problem. Uh, the slides, as you may have seen scrolling through, do contain a more theoretical description of that. Now, for the sake of the assignment, interestingly, you don't actually have to worry about this problem because it only occurs in the decompressor. The assignment is to generate the compressor. Certainly, you do have to worry about this problem. I don't know. I'm looking at my calendar here. Somewhere around uh, the 1st of June might be a good time to have thought about this CSCSC problem. Um, so... Uh, Here's some pseudocode for the, the decompression logic. Uh, and we can see that it's sort of a duplicate of the encoding logic, except we've had to add this extra if statement to handle the CSCSC problem, to allow us to, to uh, bootstrap ourselves one step into the future so that we can keep following the compressor's logic. OK, so there's a part two of this lecture that I'll pose separately, which talks about now that we can do LZW compression, we have this sequence of symbols, uh, how do we go from that into some binary encoding that works with the ancient Unix compression tool? So I'm going to run off to part two now. Try and, try and follow me and join me if you can.